Question number 21. You were dispatched to a residence for a young female who was kicked in the abdomen by her boyfriend. While en route to the scene, you should ask the dispatcher if A. The patient is conscious or not. B. Law enforcement is at the scene. C. There are other patients involved. D. The severity of the injury is known. B is correct, yeah, because that's going back to this whole idea of scene safety, checking for hazards, and a violent person on scene is definitely a hazard. So that would be first priority. 22. An eight-year-old male was bitten by a stray dog. He has a large laceration to the dorsum of his left hand, which your partner covers with a sterile dressing and bandage. In addition to transporting the child to the hospital, you should A. Administer oxygen via non-rebreathing mask. B. Ask the child's father to try to locate the dog. C. Advise the child that he will need rabies shots. D. Report the incident to the appropriate authorities. I'm hearing mostly A, and was there another one out there? A and D? Okay. In this case, the answer is D. Report the incident to the appropriate authorities. So this is one of those cases we talked about how sometimes, how like 90% of the time, if there's an option and one of those options is oxygen, that's the correct one to choose. This is one of those times when there is um, a unique situation that they want you to know how to handle. Just like where we talked out with um, snake bites and things like that, where it's something specific that you, they want you to make sure you know how to actually treat that injury. So in this case, they want to make sure that you are aware that when there is any sort of dog or animal bite, like domestic animal that has bitten a person, that has to be reported to the authorities by law. Um, just like abuse of children or um, elder abuse, domestic abuse, those are things you have to report in the course of your duties. So um, that's why the answer here is D. Even though oxygen wouldn't, I mean, certainly wouldn't be bad, and it's typically what we would choose in the, if it wasn't specifically this situation, that's what you have to take into account. Does that make sense? Okay. Number 23. You and your partner arrive at the scene of a house fire where firefighters have rescued a 50-year-old male from his burning house. The patient has superficial and partial thickness burns to his face and chest. His nasal hairs are singed and he is coughing up sooty sputum. You should be most concerned with A. Treating him for hypothermia. B. Preventing the risk of infection. C. Estimating the extent of his burns. Or D. The potential for airway swelling. So I was hearing mostly C and D, right? Okay, um, let's look at the question briefly. When it says superficial burns, what kind of burns are those? First, second, or third degree? How are they classified? First degree burns, as in like sunburn. Superficial burns are, think of a sunburn. Sunburn is a first degree burn. Yeah, superficial. Like it's just affecting the top layers of the skin. Um, you're you're going to see redness. It's going to feel warm. Um, but it's not going to break the skin in any way. It's not going to actually impact kind of the underlying layers. Partial thickness burns. What are those? Those are second degree burns. Um, second degree burns are characterized by blistering typically. Um, those blisters will often pop and have like yellow fluid that was inside of them everywhere. Um, you can get partial thickness burns from sunburn as well. I've had it and it sucks. Um, but it also can happen from a whole bunch of other things. I mean, just like any other burn. Um, and then there's full thickness burns, which are third degree, which are the ones where it's actually charred um, skin, muscle, usually all the way down to the bone. So um, sometimes people say there's fourth degree burns, which it's not really a classification we typically use in like the medical world, but it basically just means really, really, really terrible third degree burns. Uh, first, second, and third are the ones you should be aware of, or superficial par partial thickness and full thickness burns are the ones, um, they'll sometimes be listed under those names. Okay, so based on this patient, who we know what his burns look like now, should we be treating him for hypothermia? No, you do want to keep a patient who is burnt warm. So it's not that this is a bad answer. It's just maybe not the most important answer. You don't, you're not expecting him to have hypothermia. You are potentially expecting some fluid loss, right, from those burns. Um, the main concerns you should have with a burnt patient, well, some of the main concerns in general, I guess, are dehydration and infection. 
um, because there's so much open or damaged skin, it's a lot easier for infections to get in and take root. And again, because of that damaged skin, they're losing a lot more fluid um, than they normally would. So those are important, but hypothermia specifically is not what you're going to be looking out for. B, preventing the risk of infection. And I know I just said that's important. However, it is not the most important out of these choices, if we keep looking. C, estimating the extent of his burns. Potentially. Like, again, A and B were both okay answers, sort of, too. C is another one of those okay answers. Like, it's not bad. You do want to know how badly he's burnt. Um, Y'all should be looking at your rule of nines. We're not really going to go over it with this question, but you need to be aware of what that is. Um, it, I know it's in your book. I know you can find it online, diagrams for all the different age ranges. Um, so you need to be able to estimate accurately burns because we divide people into categories in terms of how badly they're burned based on how much of them is burnt and how badly those burns are, or whether somebody has critical burns or non-critical burns or those different classifications. So that's something worth knowing because it helps you know how to treat them. Um, it helps you know what treatment center to take them to. Not everybody can handle, say, a critical burn that's like wrapping around the chest, for example, would be a real concern. Um, and you wouldn't just take that to any ER. However, the answer here that you really should be choosing is D. Because if you look at it, he has singed nasal hairs and he's coughing up sooty sputum, which is like mucus or like whatever the gunk is that's in your chest. He's coughing up black and his nasal hairs are singed. What does this tell us about his airway? It could potentially start swelling. It means that he got enough heat from the fire into his airway that it is affecting him. He actually has soot in his lungs. He actually has singed nasal hairs. The passages all the way down to his lungs were to some degree singed or you know, experienced way more heat than they normally should. Um, respiratory tissues are very, very reactive, and they will swell easily. So you should be concerned at this point that his airway might swell up because of the damage that it received. And that's why the answer choice is D, because airway and breathing are always most important. Even though the other things you do want to be careful about shock, not really hypothermia, but kind of the same type of treatment, you do want to be careful about infection and estimating his burns, but airway comes first. Number 24, you are transporting a stable patient with a possible pneumothorax. The patient is receiving 100% oxygen and has an oxygen saturation of 95%. During your reassessment, you find that the patient is now confused, hypotensive, and profusely diaphoretic. What is most likely causing this patient's deterioration? Is it A, a total collapse of the affected lung, B, hidden bleeding in the thoracic cavity, C, compression of the aorta and vena cava, or D, blood accumulation in the pleural space? So when we say pneumothorax, what are we generally meaning? What body part is affected? The lungs. the lungs. And what specifically is happening to one lung? Collapsed. It's collapsed. So when we say pneumothorax, we're meaning a collapsed lung um, in like layman's terms. Do we think it's likely that a total collapse of that lung would cause him to now be hypotensive and diaphoretic? No. no. Um, it would cause more of the oxygen saturation type problems to develop. It might cause him to have some altered mental status if he continues to have a decreasing level of oxygen reaching his um, blood and therefore his brain, but it's unlikely that a total collapse of just that one lung would cause this. People survive on one lung. Um, people who've had lung cancer and have parts of their lungs removed, you can survive. So your body has to adapt, but having one lung completely collapse would not automatically cause all of these extra problems. Um, what about hidden bleeding? Really, B and, B and D are kind of along the same lines, this idea of blood accumulation or hidden bleeding internally. Um, how do those fit this idea of what's happening to your patient? Okay, so potentially, yeah, both of those things could cause hypotension, which would cause the confusion and the diaphoresis, which is that sweating. Um, why is it not likely that either of those are causing the problem? Your patient has a possible pneumothorax. Um, does a pneumothorax have anything to do with bleeding inside the chest? No. So even though those things might potentially cause his symptoms, they don't fit what you currently think is happening. Um, granted, there could be a problem that could not actually be a pneumothorax, but based on the symptoms, you're pretty sure that's what it is. You're going to go off that. You're not going to assume that the original diagnosis is wrong. Um, that just wouldn't make sense. 
plus B and D also being really, really similar to each other, wouldn't necessarily be easy to tell one between the other because neither of those are things that you've talked about a ton. In this case, the correct answer is C. Now, I've, I've already said why the others don't work, but can anybody tell me why C would be the correct answer? How does it fit the symptoms that you're seeing or the signs you're seeing? So what would happen if your blood vessels that carry the vast majority of your blood get compressed? Your blood pressure is going to drop, okay? Because all of that blood that's supposed to be there, remember we talked about the pregnant woman, how you wouldn't lay her straight on her back because of that um, supine hypotensive syndrome, how the baby's going to be weighing on her um, abdominal aorta and vena cava down there and compressing it, which is going to cause her blood pressure to drop overall because the blood's no longer able to flow flow freely. It's going to kind of get trapped. Similar thing is happening here. The blood is getting trapped behind this compression um, and it's not able to flow freely and therefore that's causing the hypotension which causes the confusion and diaphoresis on either side of it. Now that makes sense from the symptom and the sign side. How does that make sense from the pneumothorax side? Okay, so pneumothorax um, a collapsed lung, that means the pressures in the chest aren't working properly. We don't know if this is a tension pneumothorax or a, a simple pneumothorax or whatever. It's a good, um, based on what a pneumothorax is, it's pretty clear that air is building up inside of the chest. Instead of in the lung and then back out where it's supposed to, it's staying in the chest and getting trapped. As more air moves into the chest and gets trapped, more pressure is in that space. And that pressure that's in that um, thoracic cavity is going to be putting pressure and compressing the aorta and vena cava. Does that make sense, how that all ties together? The pneumothorax is causing a lot of pressure, which is causing compression. The compression is going to cause hypotension. Um, it's the thing that best fits all the signs and everything that's going on with this patient, so C is the correct answer. Number 25, basic anatomy question. The lower jawbone is called the what? The mandible. Yeah, um, you're probably not going to see a ton of these on the National Registry test. They would more likely use this knowledge somehow in another question, but I don't know, they might. They might have a couple of straightforward questions for you, and it's good that you know them. Um, number 26. Upon arriving at the scene of a motor vehicle crash, you can see three patients, one who is entrapped in his car, and the other two who have been ejected from their vehicle. You should, A, begin triage to determine injury severity, B, call medical control for further direction. C, immediately request additional resources. Or D, request law enforcement for traffic control. Okay, I heard mostly A and C. The correct answer is definitely C here. Wouldn't C and D be kind of the same thing? Yeah, um, because you probably would want law enforcement. C is better because it's more general, because you don't just want law enforcement. You'd also probably want fire on hand to help with extrication if necessary. Um, you definitely want more ambulances. You've got three patients. The most you can probably easily deal with, really, I mean, you don't want to have to deal with more than one, but you really can't deal with more than two, just based on the space you have in your ambulance. And the fact that two are ejected means that you probably have at least two really critical patients. We don't know about the third one, uh, entrapped in the car. But it's clear that you're going to need a whole lot more than just you to deal with this. So you'd want to get additional resources as soon as possible. And the other things aren't bad. They're just not immediate compared to C. 27. A young male was shot in the abdomen by an unknown type of gun. He is semi-conscious, has reduced tidal volume breathing, and is bleeding externally from the wound. As you control the external bleeding, your partner should A. Obtain vi baseline vital signs. B. Apply a non-rebreathing mask. C. Perform a rapid trauma exam. Or D. Assist the patient's ventilations. D. You guys have seen a lot of questions like this by this point. You kind of know what's up. If they need ventilatory assistance, you've got to choose one with ventilatory assistance. And how do we know that he needs um, assistance? Reduced tidal volume. That's always, shallow breathing is always going to be a clue for that one. Sometimes it'll be rapid, sometimes it'll be slow, but the fact that it's shallow, they're assuming that means you, you're assuming you know that that means that it's not enough, it's not adequate. Um, again, non-rebreathing mask wouldn't fit as well, and then the rapid trauma exam and the baseline vital signs just don't happen off the top, not compared to airway breathing circulation. Number 28. Following blunt trauma to the chest, an 18-year-old female presents with respiratory distress, reduced tidal volume, and cyanosis. 
Her blood pressure is 80 over 50, and her pulse is 130 beats per minute and thready. You should, A, apply 100% oxygen in transport, B, place her supine and elevate her lower extremities, C, perform a rapid head-to-toe physical assessment, or D, provide some form of positive pressure ventilation. You know what positive pressure ventilation is? Yeah, so, I mean, it could be something as drastic as, like, a CPAP machine where it's forcing the air in each time. Um, it could also be something as simple as a BVM. It's sort of a general term that might trip you all up. But really what it's meaning is you're pushing air in versus negative pressure ventilation, which is where your diaphragm moves. There's negative pressure inside your chest, and then air can rush in. It's pushing air in regardless. So um, which of these answer choices seems to fit? D, yeah. Um, <laughs> knowing that positive pressure ventilation could mean a BVM and you know she has reduced tidal volume, that right there matches up really well. Um, applying 100% oxygen, it doesn't say how you're applying it, and so it's not as precise of an answer, and therefore it's not quite as good. Placing her supine and elevating her lower extremities, that's what we do for shock, and she is in shock, but airway and breathing are going to come a little bit higher on that list. Um, and C, perform a rapid head-to-toe physical assessment, um, again, it's, it's going to happen. You're going to want to make sure you do that, but ventilate first. 29. Following proper decontamination, a 30-year-old male is brought to you. He is semi-conscious and has rapid, shallow respirations. A quick visual assessment reveals no obvious bleeding. You should A. Begin some form of positive pressure ventilation. B. Ask a firefighter what the patient was exposed to. C, administer 100% oxygen via a non-rebreathing mask, or D, perform a rapid trauma assessment to locate injuries. A. a, we just talked about this. We probably shouldn't have the two questions that are like identical right next to each other. 30, after intubating a 44-year-old unconscious apneic male, you place him on the ambulance stretcher and prepare to load him into the ambulance. After he is placed into the ambulance, you should... A, continue ventilations with an automatic ventilator. B, reassess the patient's vital signs and attach an AED. C, reconfirm that the endotracheal tube is still correctly positioned. Or D, hyperventilate the patient for approximately 30 seconds. Now, I know that you guys don't do intubations, so the actual context of this question doesn't really, you're not necessarily expected to know. However... If you were to just look at this question, um, because this isn't completely outside, you might get this as one of those beta questions. It's not so far off from what you would know. And you can probably solve this one with logic. Um, what might you choose as the correct answer choice? C. C. You've just moved your patient into the ambulance. You've loaded him up. Um, he was already intubated, so it would be good to check and make sure that the intubation tube is still correctly positioned. Really, that's just with any intervention. If you're going to move your patient, you want to make sure that at the end of that movement, you haven't somehow messed something up for them. Um, if you ever have to backboard somebody who's standing up, you, know, you have to lower them to the ground. After you've loaded them, you still want to make sure, okay, they still have good circulation. They, you know, I have the straps tight enough, because people move and they shift whenever they're moving around. Um, so even though 30 doesn't fit in terms of actual content, you can still kind of get the idea of what you should do in that case. Do y'all need a break? Okay, let's keep going. 31. You receive a call to a local gymnasium for a basketball player with a dislocated shoulder. Upon arrival, you find the patient, a 17-year-old male, sitting on the ground. He is holding his left arm in a fixed position away from his body. There is an obvious anterior bulge to the area of injury. You should A. Assess distal pulse, motor, and sensory functions. B. Gently attempt to move his arm toward his body. C. Place a pillow under his arm and apply a swath. Or D. Flex his arm at the elbow and then apply a sling. I think I heard mostly A and B. Okay, good that y'all didn't choose C or D. Um, D definitely wouldn't do. You don't move somebody's arm around like that. And C isn't the, the best way to deal with this. However, what is the very first thing you should handle, what you should deal with? Pulse. Pulse, yeah. Remember, go back to your, um, 
your patient assessment, you've got your ABCs, you do want to go ahead and check pulse for this injury. What you're trying to find out is whether or not the dislocation has somehow impeded pulse or, or nerve function. Um, that's why you'd want to assess that first. Because if they can't, if they don't have a pulse or if they can't feel you moving them like how you'd normally do for a CMS check, you'd want to try to kind of carefully see if, you know, there's a way that you can shift it to try to make that work. Um, I'm trying to remember what we have in the book. I think you're allowed to try to move them like maybe once. You're not supposed to try to undislocate or relocate the shoulder. Um, that takes training beyond what we have because there's all the nerves and, and everything that's in there and it's going to potentially get really hurt. Um, but checking PMS is the first place that you start. And then you could try to manipulate it slightly if there was no pulse or nerve function. You could try to see if there was a way to fix that. Number 32, you have a critically injured patient in the back of your ambulance ready to be transported. There are other injured patients at the scene, and it will be approximately 10 minutes before other ambulances will arrive. Law enforcement personnel are at the scene. Should you A, transport the critically injured patient to a trauma center, B, direct a police officer to monitor the patients as you transport, C, remain at the scene until at least one other ambulance arrives, or D, assign the least injured patient the task of caring for the others? C is the correct answer, yes. Um, you don't want to abandon the other patients that may need assistance. Even though you have that one that's critically injured, you're still responsible to some degree for all of them. So um, B and D are completely out of not okay because the police officer and the least injured patient, neither one of them have any sort of training to fix stuff. Um, and transporting the patient, the one that you have to a trauma center, just means essentially that you're leaving the others to fend for themselves, and it's not acceptable. So the best choice is C. Remaining at the scene for 10 minutes really necessarily isn't that long of a time, honestly. Um, you probably have enough stuff you can do in, that, in the back of your ambulance with that one patient to keep you occupied in terms of working on them during that time. Number 33. While working in the treatment area during a mass casualty incident, a yellow tagged patient states that he is feeling better. His vital signs are stable. You should A, keep him in the treatment area and monitor him. B, downgrade his condition to a lower priority level. C, allow him to leave the treatment area on his own. Or D, ensure that he is one of the first to be transported. Do you guys remember um, how triage levels work? Yeah, so your first level, the highest level in terms of triage, is red. Red patients are ones that have life-threatening life injuries um, that can be worked on. So things like large bleeds, but they're still conscious. Um, respiratory distress, but they're still breathing. Um, things like that, that if you don't help them, they will die, but if you help them, they have a chance. Yellow is next down, non-life-threatening injuries, things like broken bones, like substantial things that they can't just walk around and do stuff, um, but not life-threatening. Broken bones, um, bleeding in a relatively less important versus an arterial bleed, just bleeding in general, uh, things like that. Green, which is the next level down, is your walking wounded. These are people who essentially can take themselves from wherever they were to the treatment area. So people who can essentially walk or at least somewhat move, they're not going to have major breaks or bleeds or things like that. It's somebody with like a minor concussion versus a broken femur kind of thing. And uh, black is the people who are dead straight up or who are non-salvageable. This is people who need CPR, who need respiratory, who are in respiratory arrest and, and need rescue breaths. Um, those, those are the main ones, people who either their heart or their lungs aren't working on their own because those people would take an incredible amount of resources, and even then, the likelihood of you getting them back is relatively low. So when you have a mass casualty situation, you want to spend your resources in the places where they can help the most people. Unless you have a ton of extra resources, you don't want to spend a large quantity of them on one patient who's probably going to die anyway. So you've got red, uh, yellow, green, and then black. Here you've got a patient who is yellow, which means, let's say for the sake of argument, that he's gotten a... He's got a broken humerus and a broken tibia and all, you know, stuff on this one side. Um, he says that he's feeling better. Does that mean that he is better? No. no. 
Um, maybe he's a, maybe he's a little bit better. Maybe he feels like he's you know gotten to sit, and so he's not as confused or something. We don't know. Um, his vital signs are stable, but it's still not appropriate to downgrade his condition. Those those classifications are specific based on what you're seeing in a patient, and you're not just going to push somebody down in the classification because they say they're feeling better. Um, so B would definitely be out. For the same reason, C would also be out, right? Allow him to leave the treatment area on his own. Again, that's for people who are in the green range, people who can actually walk around. Uh, they may not even need to be transported, people in the green range. So if you're between A and D, which one is the better answer? Like clockwork. Stop it. Okay. Sorry, what was that? A, yes. Keep him in the treatment area and monitor him. Um, he doesn't need to be one of the first to transport it, so D is incorrect. 34. All of the following are hollow abdominal organs except for the A, liver, B, bladder, C, ureters, or D, stomach. Liver. Liver is a solid organ. All the rest are hollow. Um, the bladder fills up with urine. The ureters carry the urine, so they have to be hollow. The stomach has food, stomach acid, all that good stuff. The liver is solid. That's why you can eat it. People eat liver. I'm saying, not human liver. I'm just saying, like, relatively speaking, it's a thing. No, that, I mean, no. <laughs> 35. During your assessment of a 77-year-old male who experienced a minor head injury, you note that his pupils are unequal. The patient is conscious and alert, complaining only of a slight headache. His blood pressure and pulse are stable. The least likely cause of this patient's unequal pupils is what? A, history of cataracts, B, intracranial pressure, C, previous eye surgeries, or D, scar tissue on the pupils. <coughs> so, do y'all know what cataracts are? Yeah. It's like when they have kind of a clouding behind the retina, mm -hmm. okay. Um, everything else is pretty self-explanatory. The answer here is B. Does anybody know why? It's the least likely. Because his blood pressure is stable. So if you have intracranial pressure, as an in increased in intracranial pressure, doesn't that mean your blood pressure overall is also going to go up? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it is. If you have increased intracranial pressure, overall your blood pressure is going to go up. And it would have given us a specific vital sign. It would have told us that it was something higher than normal. When it's saying that it's stable, it means that it's like in a good, comfortable range. So the best answer here is B, because history of cataracts, previous eye surgeries, scar tissue on the pupils. Frankly, y'all don't really have enough knowledge about any of those to know for sure one way or another, but intracranial pressure is the one like standout that's different. Um, and then we don't have any sign that points to that. So that's why that would be least likely. Does that make sense? It's kind of a weird question. See, this is one of those questions where you don't actually have to know how it affects. Like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know enough about cataracts to know. I just, I guess it's possible. I know people sometimes have surgery to have cataracts fixed, and that can mess up the muscles that cause your eyes to, like... Because, you know, the reason why your eyes... Um, your pupils constrict or dilate has to do with the muscles that control them. And if those muscles are, for some reason, damaged somehow that is why they maybe wouldn't move. Like, it could be a nerve thing, um, like with the head injury or whatever, but it could also be a muscle thing where the muscles themselves are damaged. And I would just assume that the cataracts would somehow damage those muscles or make it harder for them to move normally. Like I was saying, it's, it's going to be B because B is the only one that is clearly, um, I guess, contraindicated within the question. Because it says his blood pressure is stable, it wouldn't make sense for him to have high intracranial blood pressure. That's why you have to cut that one out. Even if, I mean, we don't know anything about whether or not he has a history of cataracts or surgeries or things like that. 36. A 38-year-old male was electrocuted while attempting to wire a house. Your assessment reveals that he is unresponsive, pulseless, and apneic. A co-worker has shut off the power to the house. Should you... A, initiate CPR and attach the AED. B, begin CPR and transport at once. C, assess for entry and exit wounds. Or D, fully immobilize his spinal column. A, you have a patient who's unresponsive, pulseless, and apneic. You know you do CPR, AED right away. We've had questions like that. You, you guys are, 
You guys don't need long to figure those out. 37. During a hazardous materials incident, you are working in the, trauma, in the treatment area. Excuse me. As patients are removed from the danger zone, you should... A. Remain where you are and have the patients brought to you. B. Quickly decontaminate the patients and begin assessing them. C. Perform a rapid assessment and then have them decontaminated. Or D. Retrieve patients from the decon decontamination area and begin treatment. A. So working an incident like this, remember, it is not your job to extricate patients or move patients. It is not your job to decontaminate patients. It is only your job to treat them. Um, so B would be totally out. D would be totally out. And then C, perform a rapid assessment before having them decontaminated, isn't um, the smartest choice when it comes to personal safety. So that's why that one would be wrong as well. A is the only one that fits your actual job description. 38. A utility worker was trimming branches and was electrocuted when he accidentally cut a high power line. He fell approximately 20 feet and is lying unconscious on the ground. The power line is lying across his chest. You should A. Rapidly assess the patient after ensuring the power line is not live. B. Apply insulated gloves and assume manual control of his C-spine. C. Quickly but carefully move the patient away from the power line. Or D, manually stabilize his head as your partner assesses for breathing. A. B, no, you're not going to get near him. You're not going to assume the line is live and still get near him. You always need to assume the line is live until you find out otherwise. Um, so C would also be wrong because you're not going to touch him while he's actually attached to the power line. And D doesn't say anything at all about the power line. So you're not going to assume that's the correct answer. A makes sense. You have to make sure the power line isn't live, and then you can treat your patient. 39. After assessing the patient, you determine that his condition is stable. You provide the appropriate treatment and then load him into the ambulance. While en route to the hospital, you should A. Turn your emergency lights off and obey all traffic laws. B. Keep your emergency lights on, but avoid using the siren. C. Use your lights and siren, but drive slowly and defensively. Or D. Drive slowly and remain in the far left-hand lane if possible. A. Yes. C and D are both out. Why? You're not going to drive slowly. You're going to drive at the speed limit. You do not need to speed, not with a stable patient, but you're also not going to go purposefully below the speed limit. So C and D just don't make sense. Um, B, has anyone seen an ambulance with lights but no sirens before? It usually happens mostly in residential areas where they want still people to still see them, um, but they're not worried about trying to... They're not worried enough about fast traffic to need the siren. It's more like just so that people see that they're there. Um, not the siren we typically use for moving through traffic. So anyway, B just doesn't really fit what's happening. You've got a patient who's stable. You don't really need to go lights and sirens. You want to obey all the laws, like we were saying, drive at the appropriate speed limit, but not actually speeding. Anything to add? Okay. 40. A 70-year-old male experienced sudden pain to his left thigh when he was standing in line at the grocery store. Your assessment reveals ecchymosis and deformity to the distal aspect of his left femur just above the knee. Distal circulation and sensory and motor functions are intact. The most appropriate method of splinting this injury involves A. Applying a traction splint to realign the deformity. B. Applying and fully inflating the anti-shock garment. C. Applying padded board splints to both sides of the leg. Or D. Binding the legs together and elevating them six to eight inches. So when do we use a traction splint? Yeah, for a mid-shaft femur fracture, meaning a femur fracture that is approximately in the middle, not at either the proximal or the distal end. Um, in this case, that would be the incorrect answer because... No. Traction, fe traction splint is only for mid-shaft femur fractures. That's, it pulls that traction, and that's, that's all it's actually good for. So any other break at any point on the femur, or the leg in general, um, would not be indicated in traction splint. Uh, in that case, answer, answer A is wrong. Excuse me. What about B? Applying and fully inflating the anti-shock garment? We talked about this, right? The PASC pants? Um, 
pneumatic anti-shock garment, PASG, P-A-S-G. Um, what is that used for? That we talked about, anybody remember? We talked about it being a broken pelvis and shock being the two indicators, right? So those PASG pants put pressure all on the lower extremities, forcing blood up, so blood is going to stay more in the torso and the really important parts of the body. Um, that doesn't seem indicated here, plus he doesn't have a broken pelvis. He's got a broken femur or something, looks like that's the closest thing is what we're getting. Um, and past pants are not indicated for broken femur. You wouldn't want to put a whole lot of external pressure on a broken femur like that. So between C and D, which one seems like a better choice? C is the correct answer. D isn't actually applying a splint. Binding the legs together is going to be more appropriate for like a hip fracture. Um, where you don't really have a good way to splint that, so the best thing is just to put it next to the other one so they can both kind of keep each other stable. But in this case, you've got that distal femur fracture. You want to just go ahead and splint that like you would, say, a tibia fracture or something like that. Does that make sense? Number 41. A female patient with a suspected spinal injury is breathing with a marked reduction in tidal volume. The most appropriate airway management for her includes A, hyperventilating her at 30 breaths per minute, B, administering oxygen via a non-rebreathing mask, C, ventilation assistance to maintain an SAO2 or SpO2 of 90%, or D, assisting ventilations at an age-appropriate rate. D, yeah. Assisting ventilations is necessary. Age-appropriate rate, they're just kind of saying that. Maybe to throw you off. Um, we don't actually know how old she is. So I guess the reason why they're not giving us a rate is because, like we were talking about with the vital signs being different at every age, if she's 8, the rate's going to be different than if she's 38. So, Number 42. A 39-year-old male sustained a large laceration to his leg during an accident with a chainsaw and is experiencing signs and symptoms of shock. You should A, apply direct pressure to the wound, B, place the patient on 100% oxygen, C, take appropriate BSI precautions, or D, perform a rapid trauma assessment. C, C. BSI precautions come first, even though all the others are going to be important, C is first. 43. After successfully intubating a 56-year-old man who is in cardiac arrest, you should... Well, okay, first off, we're not going to actually expect you to know the answer to this question, but we're going to talk about it a little bit. A, perform asynchronous CPR. B, defibrillate him with the AED. C, ventilate at a rate of 30 breaths per minute. Or D, insert a PTL to occlude the esophagus. So, who knows what asynchronous CPR is? Okay, if... I'll tell you, if synchronized CPR has you matching up 30 compressions to two breaths back and forth in a rhythm, yeah, it would be not synchronized CPR. So asynchronous CPR is actually just what it's called when you have an advanced airway in a patient, like an intubated patient, and you're not needing to um, stop the compressions to give breaths. It just means that both are going constantly at the same time. I don't know that you'd really see this phrase on your test, but it doesn't hurt to know and be aware of what that means. Typically, you know, you have to stop 30 compressions to two breaths and back and forth. But when you have that advanced airway, um, you don't have to stop compressions because something is in there. So you don't have to worry about air getting forced back out by the force of the compressions. And somebody will just sit. If you've ever seen CPR done, like, on an ambulance, if a paramedic's around, they, they put the tube in, or even in the hospital, they put the tube in, somebody's always, like, doing the BVM, and someone else is constantly doing compressions. They don't stop. That's asynchronous CPR. So now you know, like, what the official term for it is. Yeah, a hospital or anywhere with at least like a paramedic level of knowledge, they're going to intubate and then that's what they're going to do. So it's just, it, us as basics, we can't do this because we can't put in that advanced airway. How about the, I've seen them just do the diagram they were They usually are. I guess I can't say for sure what that hospital has in terms of its protocols. I can just say typically asynchronous CPR is used for a patient who already has an advanced airway in. Technically, it just means that you don't stop. So, I don't know, maybe. You might be right, I don't know. Anyway, that's asynchronous CPR. Um, and does anybody know what a PTL is? 
Probably the answer is no. Uh, PTL is a type of advanced airway. It's okay, I had to look it up when I was going over these questions. I had to Google it. It stands for pharyngeal tracheal lumen. So pharyngeal, we know what that means. Tracheal, we know what that is. And the lumen is, like the word lumen is essentially talking about the opening. So a PTL, um, you might hear people talk about a combi tube or a king airway. Those are all different names. Um, they're slightly different um, mechanisms or slightly different actual pieces of equipment, they work essentially the same way. It's basically tubes that go down and they stay in. If you already have somebody intubated, you don't need to put one of those in. But just so you know, that is what that is. A PTL or, like I said, king tube, um, combi tube, or other options. So anyway, in this case, the answer would be A. Like, if this was a question, we'd expect you to know the answer would be A, because essentially you've got the intubation, so you've got airway, now he's in cardiac arrest, so you need to do CPR. Um, but you don't, we're not expecting you to know the whole question because of all that extra information. 44. You are treating a patient who experienced a significant exposure to cyanide. He is semi-conscious and is breathing inadequately. The most appropriate method of providing assisted ventilations to this patient is to A. Use a BVM B. Perform mouth-to-mask ventilations C. Request a paramedic unit to intubate or D. Perform mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilations a. a is basic. We know that's the standard in terms of providing assisted ventilations for a patient. It's always the best option. 45. The musculoskeletal system refers to A. Bones and voluntary muscles of the body. B. Nervous systems control over the muscles. C. Connective tissue that supports the skeleton. Or D. Involuntary muscles of the nervous system. A, bones and voluntary muscles. This is a straight-up definition question. I would not expect you guys to miss that one. 46. A 54-year-old male experienced an avulsion to his penis when his foreskin got cut in the zipper of his pants. He was able to unzip his pants and remove the foreskin prior to your arrival. Your assessment reveals that he is in severe pain and that the avulsion is bleeding moderately. The most appropriate treatment for this patient includes... A, applying direct pressure with a dry, sterile dressing. B, covering the avulsion with a moist, sterile dressing. C, requesting a paramedic to administer pain medication. Or D, administering 100% oxygen via non-rebreathing mask. A, yeah. This is one of those, even though oxygen is on there as a choice, the best answer in terms of dealing with that specific injury situation is dry, um, dry sterile dressing, direct pressure. Just like with anything that is bleeding a substantial amount. 47. You and your partner are the first to arrive at the scene of a motor vehicle accident. As you approach the scene, you can see multiple patients, some walking and others who are still in their vehicles. You should A. Establish an incident command post until relieved of your duties. B. Declare a mass casualty incident and request additional resources. C. Begin rapidly triaging all patients before requesting additional help. Or D, immediately move all ambulatory patients to a pre-designated area. B, yeah, just like the other one that we had, you want to get those additional resources as quickly as possible. 48, a five-year-old male presents with respiratory distress, a low-grade fever, and a cough that resembles a barking seal. The child's mother tells you that he has had a runny nose for the past few days and then developed a cough that worsened at night. On the basis of this child's presentation, you should suspect A, croup, B, asthma, C, bronchitis, or D, epiglottitis. So let's talk about each one of these um, diseases. Uh, first off, which one are you guys probably most familiar with? Asthma. Probably asthma. Yeah, either asthma or bronchitis are ones that we've talked about, I think, a fair amount, or at least you, either you have them or you've known somebody who's had one of them. Um, you all know what asthma is. It's just the re those respiratory tissues get inflamed. Um, people tend to have a hard time breathing if they get too, you know, I guess, overworked too hard or anxious. It kind of depends on the person. Um, and they have to take a meter dose inhaler to try to kind of um, stop the reactivity of those respiratory tissues so they can breathe normally again. Bronchitis is an inflammation of the bronchioles. Um, if it's not helped, it can lead to pneumonia. Uh, patient who's got bronchitis might have kind of like that traditional like fever presentation, um, 
all, all the stuff that goes along with it. You guys have had bronchitis or known somebody who's had it, so you kind of know what that looks and feels like. Epiglottitis, what do you think that would be? Yeah, inflammation of the epiglottis. So in a patient who has epiglottitis, what is like the most distinct symptom that you're going to see? Well, they are going to cough. Um, you're also going to see they're going to have a lot of trouble holding their mouth closed because the epiglottis, which is just right back there um, in the pharynx or at the end of the pharynx, is going to be really painful. It's going to be really swollen. They're going to be drooling a lot because of that. Um, so they're, you're probably going to see kind of their mouth open drool as the first main sign of epiglottitis. Um, it'll be painful to swallow, to eat, to talk. Um, these patients might have a fever just like with any other inflammation, infection type response. Um, croup, the signature symptom of croup. Anybody know what it is? A barking cough is the signature symptom of croup. Um, if you guys aren't super familiar with these, you should look them up in your book. When I was looking through for a different question earlier, I uh, came across a whole like two-page spread, all about these four, I think, were all on there. Um, make sure you go back and read on it if you're not really familiar. But in this case, the answer would be A, because croup um, has a barking cough. It is a very, very, very distinctive side effect or symptom of that along with the respiratory distress, the fever. Th those things kind of fit in with a lot of these, maybe not asthma as much. Um, but croup, that barking cough, that's what makes that one distinctive. If it's that a five-year-old male presents with respiratory distress, low-grade fever, and um, excessive mouth drooling, you'd say epiglottitis. Or if it didn't include the mouth drooling and the cough, but just said distress and fever, I'd probably say bronchitis. So you kind of have to look at what's there and try to figure out the... Um, the closest representation of what's going on. Number 49. You are approaching an overturned tanker truck to assess the driver who appears to be unconscious. As you get closer to the vehicle, you note the smell of noxious fumes and find that you are in the midst of a vapor cloud. What should you do? Should you A, remain where you are and perform a visual assessment of the patient? B, cover your face with your shirt and quickly extricate the injured driver? C, exit the area immediately and gather information for the hazardous materials team? Or D, realize that you are in the danger zone and prevent others from entering? C is the correct answer, yes. You get yourself out of danger first. Um, what, is it, what do you think it means when it says gather information for the hazardous materials team? Yeah, so the placard on the side of the um, truck is going to be a good sign. Do you all remember what those look like? Yeah, it's like a little, like, it's a square turned on its side. It's a diagonal, I guess, square. Yeah, diamond, thank you. That's the word that I couldn't come up with in my head. And it's divided, so you've got, um, hold on, let me. So. We're going to draw one of these real quick so you can kind of see um, what it would look like. Okay. So it's going to look, you know, like that. Four sections. Um, let me see if I can change color on this. Oh, nice. Okay. So the top, this part up here is going to be red. This part's going to be not really quite this light of a blue, more like a royal blue, but that's the best I've got up here. Um, this part is going to be yellow, and then down here is white at the very bottom. So that's what it looks like, and everything stands for something. So the red is going to be fire, as in flammability. Um, how likely is this thing to catch fire? Blue is going to be health hazards. Um, how dangerous it is to your health. And everything is ranked from a zero to a three. So I, th I think it's up to a three. Might be up to a four. Probably should check that in your books. But um, whichever one is the higher number it is the worst, and then it goes down to where zero is nothing. And then yellow is going to be reactivity, um, as in like chemical reactivity. White down here is going to be if there's anything specific, like if it's a corrosive thing, um, if it 
gives off radiation, if it reacts to water, stuff like that. Um, there's going to be symbols down in the white section to describe what's going on. You might also see something on the tanker truck that shows that something is radioactive, which is that orange sign. Does everybody remember kind of what that looks like? I totally can't draw that, but it's like orange and it's got this swoopy curly you know what I mean. You can look it up um, if you don't remember what it looks like. But those are the kinds of things that you want to look for to see if you could help. Um, excuse me, to see if you could help the hazardous materials team better understand what's happening with the tanker truck. Would you not, try to get the guy out? not because you don't have any protective equipment. So it's not like how it is in the house. No, good question though, because we did talk about that question where you smell natural gas and um, and you want to get out or you took them out with, when you went. And the difference is that when it's natural gas, we know what's going on with it. We know that we can safely be inside for a brief period of time, and as long as we get out quickly. With this, we don't know. Um, and we don't want to put ourselves in a situation that we can't predict what's going to happen. So that would be why. Uh, along with the placards, you'd also want to look and see if there is... I, we know that there's a vapor cloud, but also if there is... Any liquid spilled on the ground, if there's any color to either the cloud or the liquid, just anything you can tell them is going to help them better understand maybe what, what they're looking at, what kind of equipment they need. Um, in this, yeah, in this question, we think he's unconscious. We aren't actually at the vehicle yet. We're just standing in the vapor cloud near it, so you wouldn't want to keep going forward into something that you don't know. But that's a good question. Okay, 50. A football player experienced a possible spinal injury when he was tackled. He is conscious and alert, but tells you that he is having trouble breathing. His respirations are 28 breaths per minute and labored. He is still wearing his helmet. You should A. Leave the helmet on, secure him to a long backboard, and give oxygen. B. Ask him to carefully remove the helmet as you support his head and neck. C. Leave the helmet on, but be prepared to remove it quickly if he deteriorates. Or D, carefully remove the helmet, immobilize his spine, and administer oxygen. So what are the rules that we know about when to remove or not to remove a helmet? Okay, so if a helmet that somebody is wearing is impeding the mouth or breathing in general, if you can't properly assist their breathing when they're wearing a helmet, you would want to remove it um, as best you can. You'll see this problem more often with like motorcycle helmets that have a, a, a solid thing across the bottom where it's really difficult to access the mouth. Uh, but that could be in the case here as well. Not all helmets have a removable grill, so if you really had to get access, it might be hard to. Um, when, what else as far as removing a helmet? Is there any other time that we remove one? Generally not. Um, as long as it's a reasonably snug, well-fitting helmet, it's going to potentially help in terms of keeping um, that spinal situation looking good basically um if you can't properly immobilize him or something like that with the helmet on you may have to get a little bit inventive with padding you might take it off but generally speaking the only time we really do remove it is um if there's an issue with breathing and we can't properly access so this patient is telling us that he's having trouble breathing and his respirations are 28 breaths per minute and labored what would we do as an intervention for this patient when it comes to airway and breathing So you'd probably want to do a BVM, right? Yeah. Okay. Do you think you could make a BVM work around a helmet with the helmet still in place? Mm -hmm. Probably not. Um, if there's really any breathing issues going on at all and the helmet is easily enough removed, you'd want to go ahead and remove it. In that case, the answer here that's going to be best is um, D. D. Yeah, sorry. I had to find where it was on my page. Carefully remove the helmet, immobilize his spine, and administer oxygen. None of these actually say BVM, so you don't have to look for an answer with that one in it. It's just be aware of what you'd have to do. Think of the mechanics of the situation, and it'd be a lot harder to put a BVM on somebody who's got the helmet on as well.